the current uh, panel was designed based on uh, the recent report of World uh, Economic Forum Energy Transition Index, which ranked the countries based on their readiness for the energy transition. And in discussion with the Professor Duic, I suggested that we have the panel with the focus of the countries in the, in the region. So uh, let me first introduce the panelists. Uh, I will use my I will use my power presentation to get it done. Okay. So I'm the moderator. I'm professor at the Faculty of Electric Engineering University of Tuzla in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the panelists are Professor Neven Duic from the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering University of Zagreb, Croatia, Dr. Andrej Gubina, Faculty of Electric Engineering University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, Professor Emanuel Karakas, National Technical University of Athens, Greece, Professor Natasha Markovska, Macedonian Academy of Science and Arts, Skopje, North Macedonia, Ms. Milka Mumovic, Energy Community Secretary at Vienna, Professor Nikola Rajaković, Zdeve Serbia, and Professor Igor Ušanović, Faculty of Mechanical and Energy University of Podgorica, Montenegro. So the plan for today's panel is as follows. First, I just want to remind you that this is uh, being recorded and will be available uh, on uh, uh, YouTube platform. We will have a short introductory remarks to frame the discussion by myself. Then we'll have three to five minutes for introductory remarks from all the panelists, which should take approximately half an hour. Then uh, I will ask one or two questions uh, depending on the time and the answers from the panelists. Then we will open question and answer session. Questions could be posted uh, uh, on uh, question four, it will be visible to us. I will uh, review the questions and if the time allows, we'll try to answer all the questions or at least those who are connected to the presentations. And then we will have some concluding remarks by myself and the, and the panelists. So taking into consideration the time, let's just go briefly. I said uh, that the idea came from the World Economic Forum Energy Transition Index. So the ranking that I will be referring to is from the latest 2020 reports. We can talk about technical, institutional, financial, but above all, the aspects of political economy. Uh, I would like to have a focus on uh, specific areas of power sector, which is scale up of renewables, in the region of Southeast Europe and combined with that phasing down or phasing out of the coal power plants, having in mind a very, very small size of electricity markets of each of the countries. And just as an introductory part, I would like to inform you about the results of the project called REPCONS, Renewable, Recon uh, Renewable Policy Consensus Building that was supported by European Climate Foundation and uh, between which a survey conducted in Bosnia and Serbia, Serbia and Montenegro indicates that support for the energy transition exists among the experts. 90% of the participants consider that transition is inevitable. But then they are split regarding the speed. They also expect that the key drivers will be impact of the EU energy climate policy, which means political impact. And uh, then economic impact, which is the falling cost of technologies, above all uh, photovoltaic wind power. The review, the, the survey also indicated that the different starting positions of the countries, an example in this uh, survey of Serbia and Bosnia Herzegovina versus Montenegro, which is connected to the present generation mix and uh, share of the call should be, should be considered. So my discussion, my, my questions will be along these lines uh, trying to get the answer from all the participants about the state of the art and the prospect for energy transition in their individual countries. So as you see, I'm trying to keep it in five to eight minutes. So I will ask you also to keep it within three to five minutes time slot. 
and I invite Professor Nevin Duic from the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering University of Zagreb, Croatia, <clears throat> to give his introductory remarks. Nevin, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, one day in Europe, there were 30.6% of uh, wind in energy system. Uh, it's not too much, only 30%. What happened in, um, uh, on Bosnia and Croatian border, it's even more interesting. Uh, instead of usual import from uh, Bosnia to Croatia of coal electricity, there was a huge export of uh, excess wind electricity from Europe to Bosnia. This is an interesting uh, thing to notice that only 30% level of wind uh, penetration in European power system. Uh, we did the calculations of uh, uh, Southeast European uh, energy system. Um, and in 2016, uh, if you um, look at Bosnia, uh, it is exporting electricity. Everything above uh, the flat black line is exporting electricity. Uh, the, uh, gray, uh, the, the brown uh, part is uh, uh, coal electricity and lignite, and the blue one is uh, hydro. It doesn't mean it's exporting hydro, it just means it has access to export. Serbia is also exporting. Uh, the green uh, part is uh, countries which are importing electricity. So this is what we had in 2016. If we look at 2030, with expected increase of uh, renewables, uh, Croatia going uh, quite strongly to uh, low carbon uh, technologies, uh, and even Slovenia going a little bit towards uh, renewables, uh, then we can see in Bosnia, Bosnia becomes electricity importer, uh, coal is significantly reduced, uh, uh, in Serbia also no exports. Croatia becomes electricity exporter. So what happens is that uh, uh, whatever uh, the countries do, if one country decides to go renewable, everybody else uh, who has coal is punished. Uh, we used uh, theory, uh, game theory, in order to uh, plot different strategies and scenarios of different countries. Uh, in case that even more countries, even Bosnia goes for renewables, uh, there is a lot of wind potential in Bosnia. Uh, the similar thing happens, coal and lignite go even further towards zero, uh, but there is still import. So Bosnia should actually go much more towards renewables in order to uh, avoid importing electricity. Thank you. I'm unmuted now. Thank you, Nevin, for an interesting uh, opening. Uh, I call now Dr. Andre Gubina to give his uh, introductory remarks. Andre, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So I don't have slides to share, but uh, for me, uh, so uh, Slovenia has been um, quite successful with uh, the with finding this balance it also has uh, submitted the annual report about the fulfillment of this national energy and climate plan according to the regulation of eu of 2018-1999 and uh, it has designed the Slovenian national energy and climate plan regarding this so um, we are now preparing several activities regarding this and um, uh, in particular, we are uh, the faculty. We're filling the new wind with this re with this support to the opening of the energy arena and uh, of the democratization of energy supply. And we are involved in several uh, activities and uh, several demonstration Horizon 2020 projects where we look at the um, and the. Um, self-supply and energy communities as this empowering of the prosumers 
because the, also Slovenia has moved into this support of self-supply to attract private investments into energy field. And uh, that's why uh, we are designing solutions, technical and social solutions to implement the steps that need to be implemented to answer the questions Professor Duric was showing uh, earlier on his expose. And I would like, I I'll be happy to discuss this later because uh, we've been in more than five Horizon projects just on this topic in, the, in, in my laboratory. Thank you. So thank you, Andre. We are really keeping on time and according to the schedule. Now I will call Professor Emmanuel Caracas. Professor Emmanuel, do you hear me? Yes, I am here. So the floor is yours. Please have your three to five minutes introductory remarks. I will start by saying uh, hello to everybody and thanking you for having me here. It's a real pleasure uh, to come back to this event. Uh, I remember Professor Duitz, dear Nevin, being much younger when we started this. But as we grow older, things are changing. And the same um, holds true also to, to my home country. And uh, if you look in the abstract I have submitted, you might uh, presume that uh, I've uh, applied, uploaded to the wrong conference. But it's not quite that. Uh, the fact is that, uh, that Greece is um, taking some bold steps to, e to energy transition. In fact, the country has the last decade made strong commitments uh, towards the increase of renewable air, but that was merely um, a, a subsidized approach to attract uh, the usual uh, uh, suspects, I would say, wind and solar. And we managed to raise the share of renewables to roughly 30%. And now, out of the blue, a country that uh, in the last decade was producing 60% of their electricity from coal, uh, the last year uh, it merely produced one th uh, half, uh, less than 30, and it has announced a very ambitious goal to go coal-free, to have a coal exit, a full coal exit in Greece by 2028. First question, is that feasible? Uh, second question, is that realistic and sustainable? And I will start by, uh, by saying what I just said uh, earlier in the morning when the coal regions in transition, the Just Transition Fund was launched in, in Brussels, saying that uh, having ambitious goals uh, is uh, uh, something that uh, paves the way in the energy transition. So yes, I think it's feasible. Yes, electricity price is catching up. Yes, a, a Greece from energy or electricity independent due to the lignite is now heavily uh, relying on imported gas, but we consider gas as a transition fuel. Yes, we suffer from the limited uh, interconnection, but we put our effort into the development of regional markets in the neighbor, neighboring countries. And yes, we think that in a full and aggressive introduction of renewable, uh, hydrogen in the next decade uh, is uh, a possible solution that could lead us to a 100% renewable future. Why not uh, much earlier than 2050 as other European countries are uh, there? And by that, I think I have used my three to five minutes, but I would be glad to, to discuss that uh, with uh, colleagues that share more or less the same background from myself, coming from coal and ending to something completely different. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Professor Caracas. So we have chosen to start from the EU members of the region. So it's Croatia, Slovenia and Greece. Even though probably the state of the readiness is similar in the other countries, until recently at least, or similar in the other countries. Now we will proceed uh, with the countries uh, from the Western Balkans. And I ask uh, Professor Natasha Markovska from uh, Northern Macedonia to have her three to five minutes of the introductory remarks. Natasha, the floor is yours.
You have to unmute your mic. Natasha, you yes. have to unmute. Okay, uh, yes. we hear do now. The, do you see the screen? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Mirza. Uh, I entitled my introductionary remark as a no call in the Macedonian latest energy and climate planning documents. And uh, now I will go, I will show uh, how. Uh, so it's uh, the recent context changing developments in, fa uh, in favor of uh, the country taking determined and accelerated steps on decarbonization pathway. Namely, uh, it is the first contracting party of the energy community which adopted an energy strategy based on the five pillars of EU Energy Union, depicting three scenarios, reference, moderate transition scenario, and green scenario. And all these scenarios reflect different dynamics of energy transition and enable flexibility into Macedonian response to relevant EU policy and governance to mo for modern, competitive, and climate neutral economy by 2050. And uh, capitalizing on domestic analytical capacities, participatory practice, experience, tools and knowledge base uh, that have been created even before and maintained, of course, and enhanced over the energy strategy timeline, the national energy and climate plan is in the final phase of preparation. Uh, the latest analysis of the mitigation potential have shown that in 2030, with 47 policies and measures, 32 from energy sector, 11 from the sector agriculture, forestry and land use change, and four from the waste sector, the greenhouse gases emissions can be reduced for 82% uh, compared to 1990 levels. All these, all uh, 47 policies and measures are elaborated uh, in a table format as presented on the right hand side of this slide, including also their uh, connection relation to uh, achievement of sustainable development agenda. Next. And this is about uh, 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 environmental effectiveness, but also this is the marginal abatement cost curve for 2030 for the green scenario. And uh, as can be seen that most of the measures, the, may all, the predominantly, predominantly uh, with negative costs or all, almost all of them are of win-win time meaning that over 20 year period, the decarbonization scenario is cheaper than the fossil fuel based scenario. And uh, in terms of jobs, nearly 8,000 jobs can be created in the year 2030 if the measures are implemented with the plan dynamics. 60% uh, related to uh, renovate, retrofit of the houses and uh, uh, building of uh, new ones. And 30% of these newly created jobs are related to renewables, particularly solar, uh, photovoltaic sector, and uh, solar thermal vectors. Um, and um, in addition, uh, given that almost depleted reserves of domestic lignite and the oil and gas import, it seems that there is no other option, but it is a matter of time when meeting the energy needs could be realized only with renewable energy uh, sources combined with intensive energy efficiency. 
which means phasing out of coal, gas, only for industry and combined heat and power generation in the cities. Sector coupling, uh, meaning electrification of heat and transport sectors, also plays a considerable uh, role in the decarbonization pathway of the national uh, energy and climate sector development. Thank you for your attention. Nasha, thank you for uh, interesting information regarding the strategy we have all heard about. Of course, I will have some questions uh, later in the question and answer session. But now I uh, propose we proceed. I'm now calling uh, Ms. Milika Mumovic from the Energy Community Secretariat. We had an uh, excellent introduction in the morning with the power plant presentation. So I will. Uh, Looking forward to see what new regarding this aspect of the energy transition we have to hear from the Energy Community Secretary. Milka, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, regarding the introduction, I really said in the morning a lot about the, the one part of the transition, which is related to introduction of carbon pricing, which is actually the polluter pays principle, which we all agree, I think there is no uh, uh, opposition voice against it now. The question that is put is about dynamics, the scope, the steps, schedule, and so on. And it is often uh, in, uh, regarded in combination with the security of supply issues. Security of energy supply is the most important policy and uh, national security topic for the last hundred years all over the world. This is the issue. But now this, uh, with, the new, with the new model, with the new infrastructure and the connections, in particular in electricity and gas, the network energy sectors, it uh, gives floor to another concerns. And now this is, of course, the climate and the security, but with the, with the concerns and with the respect to climate protection and environment protection. We know that to ensure energy security, the policy makers were considering always different, like uh, fuel mix, import uh, or dependency. Then they were considering substitutes to any primary supply, changes in final consumption and so on, infrastructure development, now we are sure that infrastructure is quite solid and it will be even better to ensure this interconnectivity of our energy systems. And the question that should be put when developing national energy and climate plan, which is actually the task in the energy community of all contracting parties, the work already started, is to open every question, every possible question. Nothing is given granted. Like energy security is a national issue, it is of course, but is the import really the greatest risk possible? Is it possible to rely on the neighbors and how much? This question should also be open. Then the chain is in the final consumption. It is really part of the national energy and climate plans and of course we all have to be fully open. There are some initiatives and processes that we are aware they are going, they are taking place, they are going on like uh, distributed generation, local renewable sources, energy cooperatives or communities. I am avoiding the word because we are energy communities, so that co cooperatives, aggregators, they are all getting in the game. In the energy community contracting parties, we really have to be open to this, to make administrative and regulatory and legal framework that they can flourish. And this is flourish, and this is not the case yet. In this energy community, we are developing policy guidelines, recommendations of the good practice. We are doing a lot on capacity building to enable this. And this is one part of this, uh, let's say it is not fight, but this uh, awareness of this campaign. Uh, the other thing is also what, is, what the future will bring. We expect a lot of hydrogen. Uh, before that, we're expecting a lot of carbon capture and storage. Uh, this is actually air electricity and uh, re energy power storage. It will probably develop. Our planning documents should rely on this or take them into account and be flexible in order to accommodate this. But priorities should be put. 
in the sense that first we want clean air and clean waters for the generation that will come. Uh, when we are talking about 2050 targets, I, I was joking, probably I will not be here to witness 2050. I mean, I mean chances are really low, but I have children and children, and I really want that they have safe uh, environment in which they could live. And so this is, let's say, my, uh, my, my greatest concern as a person now, not as an employee of the secretariat or somebody, it is to do all I could to make this system better system when they can use, let's say, local renewable sources, other sources, and improve the quality of the air and of the waters where they live. And our policymakers, of course, in the planning and the measures that will come, but also Natasha mentioned, that measures are different. There is myriad that they have to be flexible to adapt to the situation as the technology provides an answer and solution to adapt the measure to it and always to make it, uh, let's say, uh, sustainable in a manner that, for example, citizens will invest in their own resources if they are incentivized properly. The proper incentive is that opportunity costs are there. As long as we have uh, subsidization of the- Mika, you have one minute more. Yeah, you have one minute more. As long as we have subsidization of the cost of electricity or gas for the population, they will not be incentivized to invest in their own, let's say, solar panels or, 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 or geothermal sources or heat pumps. So it is all a combination. It has to go that way. Thank you. Thank you for interesting uh, view from the Energy Community Secretariat on a very complex issue of energy transition in the region. But now uh, we proceed with the next panelist. It's Professor Nikola Rajakovic from Serbia. Nikola, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I didn't prepare uh, slides, but I have see here some notes just in order to be more precise. Uh, uh, what we have in Serbia, probably all of all of you quite aware, uh, just let me remind you, majority of electricity generation in Serbia is based on a combination of large scale thermal and hydro plants. More than 95% we produce. Now we do have uh, 500 megawatts in wind, we expecting uh, much more, and solar is still, still uh, uh, behind. Uh, what is good, uh, due, uh, good news from Serbia, the government is committed to increase investment in, in, uh, in uh, uh, renewable energies. And uh, uh, they, promoted, uh, they promoted the connections to, to different, uh, to, to different uh, authorities. So uh, uh, at the moment, uh, we considering a sort of uh, transition mechanism. We used to have feed-in tariff. Uh, it has been introduced uh, in 2009 and still is, uh, is, is still is uh, active, but it's going to, to be finished in, in one year. So the next option, as far as I know, is a sort of auctions and EDRD uh, is in preparation phase together with our government to envisage the, how to increase the penetration of renewables. Uh, open question is uh, how to improve the efficiency of the bal balancing costs. Uh, what, we have, uh, what we have at the moment during the last five, 10 years, the, the overall production, two thirds of that production from coal, from lignite, the overall production is close to 40 terawatt hours. So in, uh, in, in the 20 years, let's say, we, will, we should replace more than 20 terawatt hours, nowadays produced from thermal power plants with uh, renewables. I'm quite positive 
during last 10 days, we enjoyed the physical on-site conference on Zlatibor, Energetica 2020. And we had a very fruitful discussion. And uh, I would say the big change in, in, in uh, public opinion in Serbia is uh, quite positive in connection to energy transition. Some of speakers uh, see very positive sides, very positive sides of, of energy transition. So that's good. But uh, of course, it's uh, quite uh, difficult for everybody, uh, everybody who is involved in the whole process uh, can, can support such an opinion. Uh, what we discussed uh, uh, on Zlatibor, we, dis we discussed even market redesign uh, because, uh, of course, uh, we will have much more difficulties in, uh, in the near future with capacity market and the very interesting standpoints and very interesting way of uh, thinking have been introduced and we can uh, we can comment later on for uh, i think for the introduction that's enough thank you nicola thank you very much for raising important questions uh, regarding the uh, the subject i put as a sort of the priority in the second part but in the first part of course you have all liberty to reflect on the energy transition state status in your country. So I now call Professor Igor Vushanovic uh, from Montenegro, the country that is uh, really serious in the last couple of years on embarking on the energy transition pathway. Regarding the small size of the country, it's interesting uh, how that will be developing. So uh, Professor uh, Igor, the floor is yours for your five minutes. and. Uh, I just encourage the participants. We have 22 participants apart from the panelists to start putting the questions and answers. Questions, answers will be probably from the panelists. And uh, Igor, the floor is yours, please. Just switch on the microphone, Igor, please. You don't hear, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for a nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to have an opportunity to talk with you on this conference, in this panel, especially in the energy transition, because this is a field that I'm uh, very interested in. Uh, as you know, Montenegro as a small country, uh, most of our potential lies on the hydro potential, and we have uh, deposits of uh, lignite in the city of Plevlja, and we, of course, uh, fortunately, we are uh, lucky in the recent time because we have a huge hydro, huge uh, wind potential and the solar potential. Uh, regarding the energy transition, our government is uh, really committed to the uh, go on track and to follow the all European uh, policy regarding the energy transition. And uh, I can say and, uh, that we made some steps uh, we have a two huge wind parks in Montenegro. One is already is in operation. It's a 78 megawatts in the place of, in the north of Montenegro on the mountain of Krnovo. And the second one, Mojora, is near the city bar in, uh, on the coast. And it will be in operation very soon. I, th I think it's already in, uh, in operation, but I don't know the details. And we are um, uh, planning to build a huge uh, solar power plant. I think it will be one of the most, uh, one of the biggest in this part of Europe. It's about 250 megawatts. So uh, another important thing that uh, I'm very proud to say here to all of you is that Montenegro is already have a cable which connects uh, our coast with Italy, which is about uh, one gigawatt. Uh, 1,000 uh, of megawatts, so that give us an opportunity to stabilize our system and also to export or import energy from this field or from Balkan to the Italy, to the half of Italy, and uh, this is a very nice opportunity. So Montenegro, I would say, uh, uh, becoming a hub, energy hub, that will be very interested, uh, interesting for uh, our neighboring countries. So. Uh, 
main problems regarding the CO2 emissions in Montenegro coming from the city of Plevlja, where we have a thermal power plant, which is built in the uh, beginning of 80s. Now uh, that thermal power plant is under the reconstruction and we believe that will be in function uh, uh, for the next, I don't know which period, but we'll be working on the highest standards regarding the emission of the CO2, SO2 and, and other pollu pollutants. Uh, also, the great potential that Montenegro has uh, lies in the solar energy because Montenegro has a more than 2000 hours, uh, very similar like Croatia, and which is totally, I would say, unex uh, un uh, un uh, employed, uh, unexploited. And we believe that in the uh, future, the energy, uh, energy sector will be as much as possible decentralized. And that's the, that, that's the key thing that we are looking for because we have a lot of potential in roofs and houses and we believe that uh, additional 20 to 30% in the big cities uh, of electric energy can be produced from roofs. So we are very looking forward in the changing the regulative and I'm proud to say that uh, we already have uh, up, to five, up, to, up to 50 kilowatts, we have a uh, uh, regulations in our uh, domestic uh, uh, law system that you can you can uh, install the system up to 50 kilowatts and our uh, energy uh, distribution company is uh, obligatory to allow you to to have a connection to the systems and to exchange the energy so we believe that this is a path to the sustainability and to decentralization because uh, we have to allow all the stakeholders in the society we have a chance to produce the energy and to exchange the energy on the place where it's produced. So we, we strongly believe in decentralization. That's the, one of the key things that we are looking for uh, in the future. The things that we are worried is about, because the country is small, we need uh, some very specific measures uh, to, uh, to, to, to increase the stability because the Montenegro is a small, small country. And we believe that, that, that this cable that we built uh, from Montenegro to Italy will help us uh, to make a stable system in, uh, that will give us some stabilities. Uh, about another plants, we, are, we will build uh, two, hyd two hydropower plants. One is a hydropower plant. You have one more minute. Okay. And another one is maybe a hydropower plants in Moracha. And we are looking forward to see that those power plants will be uh, reversible, uh, uh, reversible that we can uh, uh, storage the energy inside it and so I can I believe that we can give the some contribution regionally not only in Montenegro thank you very much well I thank all the panelists for uh, really keeping uh, the time slots uh, allocated we are really on the time I don't see too many questions but they are starting to come so I will be following the questions simultaneously with the, putting the questions to you. So I propose we proceed with the questions or the questions I will ask, uh, aiming to deeper explore what you have said in your introductory remarks. So first I will put the question to Professor Vujic. We have discussed the issue of uh, regional uh, integration, uh, interrelations, etc., and you have. Uh, presented here the results of the simulation you had done with your uh, PhD students. My question is, I also agree with you that the regional aspect of the energy transition is uh, of the utmost importance. But when you were really uh, modeling possible scenarios in 10 years time, uh, I'm just asking what institutional prerequisites should be in place, like connected day head markets, intraday markets, balancing markets in the Southeast region, to enable the results of the game theory that you have presented here. And my question is basically, uh, what is your opinion on how the speed of developing this infrastructure will influence the speed of the transition? Because we are very slow in the energy community fulfilling the obligations that we have accepted regarding especially the uh, institutional arrangements I have uh, pointed here. 
So, Nevin, please hear your Thank comment you. on this. Excellent question. Um, I think that uh, part of the problem was explained in the morning by Ms. Milka Mumovic uh, when she said that uh, the main trick uh, in the Southeast Europe is that uh, coal is subsidized by hydro. Uh, and uh, this is a huge problem on one side. But on the other side, if you uh, analyze how uh, power utilities actually behave uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, they're just buying cheaper electricity. If the cheaper electricity is coming from somewhere else, uh, they will, inside their technical uh, uh, possibilities, uh, decide to buy the cheaper electricity. So, uh, even without uh, the infrastructure you mentioned, uh, there will be a strong pressure to import cheaper electricity. Croatia is now importing nearly 50% of electricity because it's cheaper. Uh, but of course, if we uh, manage to implement proper day-head markets, uh, we also need intraday markets for sure, if we want to go with variable renewables, uh, then this can be done much quicker. Because uh, without uh, the markets and without proper uh, taxation uh, that will separate hydro from coal, uh, and make it uh, impossible to cross-subsidize coal with hydro, uh, we will, of course, have uh, coal surviving for a long time because it will uh, have uh, a big amount of uh, cheap funding uh, from the hydro side. And all of the countries have reasonable uh, share of hydro in their power system. So uh, we should get uh, markets as soon as possible. As much as I know, uh, uh, North Macedonia, uh, uh, Montenegro, uh, and uh, possibly Albania will have it this year. Uh, Bosnia is a special case, but um, I hope Bosnia will also get it one day. And thank you for your remarks. My, my point was that uh, Energy transition will go anyway, but if you want efficient energy transition, then we need infrastructure. And uh, I think uh, the next couple of years is a crucial to establish that infrastructure. It's a window of opportunity, two to three years. And we shouldn't forget the third package before we jump in, in the fourth package of uh, European Union acquis. So, yes, we are in Bosnia Herzegovina, the special case, even though we only have, we are the only country that has a functional. Uh, balancing market, which is important also for, for the part of this issue that we are talking about. Thank you, Nevin. Uh, if I will have another question, it will depend definitely on the questions that we are receiving. Some questions have already started to come. I ask now Dr. Gubina. I was really, I was really interesting in uh, what you said about the prosumers and that, that uh, uh, orientation in Slovenia. But my question is uh, basically, I have been following uh, energy transition in Slovenia. Uh, I was, uh, I must say, I was a little bit surprised with the very high rank of Slovenia in the uh, World Economic Forum Energy Transition Index, ranked 23rd. So my question is, uh, in your opinion, uh, which are uh, facts which are the elements that uh, put Slovenia such high in ranking, even though, uh, for example, development of renewable energy source in Slovenia are not to the first, even not in the region that we are talking about as a rank. Yeah. Uh, and I also would like to see uh, your opinion about uh, how do you foresee uh, development of the generation portfolio in Slovenia. It's very important for Bosnia and Herzegovina and for the region. You know that Slovenia was at the moment uh, the role model for the coal in the region. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward whether we could be looking at Slovenia as a role model for the energy transition as well. So yeah. uh, Andre, please, the floor is yours to remark on my... Yeah. So thank you very much for this question. Um, Indeed, the, 
so the Slovenia energy efficiency, it's, uh, so, so, uh, so in the energy strategy for Slovenia, there is a, um, you know, this fulfillment that I mentioned earlier on that was sent to the European Commission is designed on the Slovenian National Energy and Climate Plan. So this is something that is currently, uh, we are obliged to work for, uh, towards. And for any uh, energy mix, um, so for energy su supply mix, it's important also the demand side, so the energy efficiency. So if I separate the res generation from the energy efficiency here, an important challenge remains in Slovenia. Uh, and here, so we are now focusing our efforts on uh, the um, energy efficiency in the industry that has been, so this energy efficiency in the industry has been starting to take on. Uh, so traditionally energy efficiency was targeting buildings, less so the industry. And now the new uh, actions have been set up by the government targeting these new financing instruments for the energy efficiency in the industry. Uh, we have also, for example, in one project in, at the university was a Horizon 2020 project. We looked at uh, what uh, role does energy efficiency play in consumer decision making in home buyers, in agriculture, in industry, consumer goods, vehicle purchases. And we looked at what does the labeling, what does the labeling play here, but also how does, how do all these um, policy instruments contribute towards this question to improve the energy efficiency in the standing of it. Next is the renewable generation. Here, the new government that we have since March 2020 has, uh, has restarted the process of renovating the energy law, uh, which is the largest uh, body of, uh, so leg legislative body or the uh, largest law in Slovenian legislation. Uh, the, it was uh, apparently planned to be split in two, so the energy and the climate. Uh, so now it's still, we still have about one year to, to, re to renew it and uh, improve it as with the clean energy package trans, uh, or transposition. Uh, so what we so what the government is aiming is to reduce the bureaucratic barriers for integration of renewables in the environment, meaning uh, to improve the speed, speed up the speed with which renewable generation is coming, uh, is uh, going through all the steps. Uh, so reducing the possibilities for uh, environmental groups to put on pressure and to delay the investments on this. So this is one, one thing that's going to step up uh, with the speed with which for example, hydro generation is going to be put in place. Uh, also, um, the, what is maybe important to point out is that our national um, energy and uh, climate uh, plan does not define the fuel mix as such. So for the energy transition. So it looks like there will be another iteration needed to rethink this also in the new situation regarding the COVID-19. So for the green, uh, green transition here. So there's some discussion on this ongoing in Slovenia. Uh, that probably this um, will need additional guidelines regarding the fuel mix with this renovated uh, uh, cycle. Regarding the second block of the nuclear power plant, there's been some discussion in Slovenia. It, it's put on the priority list, but there is no immediate push to this at the moment with the new government. So uh, at the moment we are waiting for the, what will come out of the, uh, we're coming out of the lockdown. What will the new government uh, put forward as priorities? Also uh, because we are now being this uh, triple presidency part with uh, Thank you. Germany taking over. Thank you, Andre, for very elaborate comments you have made. Uh, I would now, uh, proceed with a question to Professor Kakaras. I have two questions, very short questions, and I expect direct, if it's possible, short answers. The first, we all followed the, the turnaround in energy transition paradigm in uh, 
Greece, which has recently happened. So my question is, what were the key drivers that the paradigm change happened in Greece in the last year? Such a sudden change, uh, uh, such a sudden sudden decision to move away from the from the coal. All right, it's very simple. I think uh, uh, the Greek government uh, understood that there is the so-called first movers advantage in this energy transition, and this can be uh, exploited. Of course, this comes together with a very powerful tool that all of us uh, were hoping to, which is a just transition mechanism. And I think that this could uh, accelerate the transition period because it serves mainly uh, the social cohesion in regions that will be affected from this transition. So the coal regions, especially in uh, our part of uh, Western Macedonia, you all, you all have been, uh, we share effectively the same coal fields. So the, uh, the social cohesion and the adaptation to a new generation mix by the transition, uh, the just transition funds played an important role in this, in this decision. The second is the anticipation of the increasing uh, CO2 price, which hampers the, the, com uh, the, the competitiveness of uh, brown coal production in a more, I would say, uh, integrated market. And the third is the introduction of the target model in the market size, which gives us the, the regulatory tool to secure, for instance, issues like the backup power, the balancing responsibilities, the intraday market, and even try to promote energy storage. Thank you, Professor Kakaras. Well, uh, we now proceed, or I now proceed with a question to your northern border, to northern Macedonia, and I ask the question, uh, to Natasha, I was really shocked, positively shocked with your uh, figure of greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction of 82% by 2030. So I'm not going to go deeper in a very elaborate uh, maps that you have shown us, but just the question, what will be the portfolio mix of uh, power generation in Macedonia in 2030? Because it's definitely the area where you for you see the biggest reduction, or more specifically, what do you think will be the fate in 2030 of thermal power plant Bitola? Uh, definitely, there in 2030 there is no place for thermal power plant Bitola, so it's, it go it should go out uh, 2027 eight the latest, and uh, yeah, for the portfolio is uh, extensive renewables, uh, solar and wind. And also, uh, we have uh, uh, planned uh, some large hydropower plants, which are uh, uh, for a long time in the portfolio. But uh, it seems that uh, they have to uh, they have to um, enter into operation uh, in order to compensate for for the coal production. And uh, on the other side, as I showed that we had, uh, uh, it's quite clear that we have uh, very um, um, exhausted uh, coal uh, uh, lignite resources. And anyhow, it is a matter of time, uh, two, three years plus or, min or minus for uh, coal power plants. And it's uh, uh, after this robust analytical work, uh, it has been shown that uh, it is possible to uh, to build such a portfolio, and more. It is of uh, win-win type. It is cheaper if we take the total system costs, and uh, so uh, it's only the decision to be made and to uh, to enter into this story with uh, uh, with accelerated step. And I think that uh, the government will have this courage and brave and uh, um, willingness to take this decarbonization pathway 
already some developments never mentioned we have uh, uh, new developments on a on a um, market or with uh, market coupling also a lot has been done in terms of legislation we have new energy law which is uh, very supportive for energy efficiency and renewables new energy efficiency uh, law uh, just uh, two or months ago it, it was adopted but uh, all these uh, energy efficiency directives and res directives are incorporated and also uh, big support premiums now are planned for um, for photovoltaics we have also in uh, under the, the just transition uh, we have power plant Oslo May, uh, which is planned to be replaced with 100 megawatts uh, PV installation. So the things uh, have started to move uh, in these directions and there is a, um, a high uh, expectations and, and trust that the government of uh, North Macedonia will proceed uh, to this way and uh, will take this uh, green scenario which was also analytically proved that it is the best possible option for the future. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. When the government is expected to take decision about the pathway that will be uh, yeah. Well, it is adopted uh, the strategy, uh, and uh, now we are in, in a phase of uh, of, uh, of finalizing a national energy and climate plan. And for this 82 percent uh, reduction compared to of greenhouse gases uh, compared to 1990, of course uh, the bulk from this comes from energy sector and phasing out of coal but we also have some uh, mitigation potential from other sectors to top up uh, and that is um, in waste sector and in uh, also sinks from uh, forestry sector so uh, this is all together uh, um, this mitigation potential at national base economy wide i would say but uh, mainly it is connected to phasing out of coal in power generation thank you just for uh, for the participants and the for panelists we have three questions i'm following up the questions uh, they are more and less in line what we are discussing uh, will come hopefully at the end uh, also to those questions but now i'm um, I'm going to ask the question, uh, uh, Ms. Milka Mumovic. Uh, you have mentioned this earlier this morning and also in your presentation here, this new uh, area of activity of energy community, which is the climate area. But uh, in your reports regarding, uh, I call them uh, energy community case, the part of EU case that we should implement in your reports, you usually give indication uh, and evaluate what has been achieved in uh, member countries. Uh, it's probably not your uh, mandate to answer the question why some of the countries are progressing and some of the countries are lagging. And uh, that's why we are also organizing the conferences like this, where we can open up discussions about that. But my, my question is, do you think it will be useful if you could uh, have a complementary report to the report of energy community which answers the questions what with uh, some more in-depth uh, analysis bottom-up in-depth analysis why something is happening faster and not <laughs> i'm not asking you to put that in your reports i'm just asking mm -hmm. you what this is, would this it is be helpful to you would it be helpful to the whole transition process uh, we are trying to find these answers. This is not our task to put it in the report, of course. But uh, if I may say, every why would look for an excuse. When there is an achievement, uh, we don't have to distribute the credits. Everybody will take the credit. And probably when there is an achievement, many stakeholders uh, are contributing to the achievement. In case of non-achievement, and as we call it non-compliance, because the contracting parties, when they commit, when they make an agreement, commit to implement some certain part of the European Union acquis, 
then it is national obligation. This is a contract. And we, in, in finding the answer what you say, we should see why they accepted something if they were not able to deliver. This is the core question. And I think when taking obligations, accepting their key, this is the moment when each contracting party, all stakeholders should sit and see is real the, the dynamics that they can accept. Should they ask, let's say, for exemption? This is also a tool possible. But in most cases, when I consider what is going on, I would say that uh, more or less the reasons for procrastination are not very well grounded. This is not very often case. Usually it is um, kind of inertia, just to keep the things going on as they were going on so far. And uh, it, it, it requests a kind of real kick to take to change. Or when the contracting party is committed to change, as other speakers said, already uh, have said, indeed, uh, the, this is public debate is necessary, consensus is necessary on many questions, and of course, international obligations have to be honored. I have nothing to say more well, about this. Well, that's, that's what you said this morning, that you expected the players to behave reasonable. And the question is, are they behaving reasonable? We are talking here about decision makers that have, uh, that have uh, short term priorities. And we are talking about the processes which have the long-term implications. So it's this, this aspect of the political economy and the social aspect of the change, definitely we are not going to discuss in the time that is left, but it's something which is for the region now definitely on the table. If we want transition to be bottom-up, if we want transition to be indigenous, because if it is imposed, like many of the obligations, as you said, Vero agreed upon as something, you know, European Union through the energy community is requiring that we implement that. So we have to. Uh, that was partially successful. We cannot say it was not successful. It was partially successful. But if you want really to go in this new stage of uh, energy transition, we should be tackling the issues, which are also the issues why, why something is happening. And it's definitely not up to the energy community secretariat to ask. It's up to us in the region. It's, it's up to the stakeholders in the region to ask. So I'm also uh, thanking Milka for your uh, honest answers. <laughs> and uh, I have made an introduction to, to the question that I want to ask Nicola. Uh, you see, I personally see that the key for the energy transition in the region is what decision will be taken in Serbia in the next two to three years. The central part in the region, uh, the biggest power sector in the Western Balkans, uh, not so high renewable energy potential, and the priority of security of supply, that was all the time the first question in the countries like Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, my question to you, Nikola, is you mentioned in uh, one of your uh, addresses that energy transition is inevitable. I'm referring to, to here to the paper you published the Balkan Green Energy News. So it's inevitable. The question is, what the speed? And what will be the impact of the decision that the government in Serbia has recently announced, like building new thermal power plants? I mean, what is the real state of the art in the Serbian uh, uh, expert community, decision-making community, and I was really, I was really glad to hear that something is changing in the expert community when you referred to the last conference that you had. So please be honest with us uh, in uh, in your in your evaluation because of the importance for the whole energy transition of the country that uh, you are representing here. Please. Nicole. Thank you, thank you, Mirza. Thank you for the opportunity to to say more about uh, uh, energy transition in Serbia. Yes, there are some contradictory, of course, decisions. One of contradictory decisions for sure is the, generally one of, uh, to, to deal with the, uh, very old lignite projects like Kolubara B. Probably everybody knows that project. Of course, expert community is uh, very much against 
but you know, I think um, maybe maybe there is some, uh, of course, sort of inertia within uh, our national uh, national energy company EPS, a sort of inertia, a sort of conservatism, sort of uh, I would say very st strong uh, lignite coal uh, coal uh, uh, trade union trade. Uh, uh, trade union group. Uh, they are very much afraid what's going on in, in coal sector and uh, they are worried uh, about their future. So uh, in my opinion, speed is of course important. I agree completely with you. Uh, speed is very important and the optimal speed can solve in, of course, in my opinion, can solve these problems. Uh, for the moment, we have to we have to stop any discussion in regard to new lignite projects. We have to finish that uh, project which is underway. That is project in uh, Costolats, Costolats B3, 350 megawatts. We are not very much uh, expert community is not very much happy with the, with the performance, uh, technical performance of that project. And also if we have in mind the CO2 taxes in the near future, economic aspects of that project is under question, big question mark. So that is uh, the coal, we, we will uh, rely on coal in next 10, 15 years, but not more, not more, that is for sure. It's going to be changed for sure. And I think the process is underway. The good news that the uh, number of demo process of, uh, let's call it democratization of energy sector of electricity. Um, in Serbia, we have, number of new participants, you know, we still don't have a regulatory framework perfectly designed, but uh, anyway, uh, new, new, every day we have a new participant on, on, on the grid. Even some industry are very much interested in solar panels on their roofs and on their parking lots and things like that. I'm very happy with this. Also, in, uh, in, I think in one year, we will have very huge wind park, uh, 250 megawatts South Bana again. So hydro, hydro potential, we still have not very much, but 20% uh, more than at, at the moment is available. New, new investments are needed there. Um, all in all, uh, energy transition is for sure underway in Serbia. We are, the speed is not probably the, the gradient, the trends are not uh, perfect, but uh, I would like to, 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 to speed up the whole process. But it's not, of course, uh, the inertia of the whole system is huge. And uh, we have to be just careful and patient, and we will succeed. Thank you, Nikola. Thank you for being honest. Before I put the question to Professor Vushinovic, I would like to inform you that we have received three questions. I will be including uh, the questions in the remaining part of the session. We have 20 minutes more. And I would like to focus the remaining part uh, of the session on the regional aspect of energy transition. That's not incidentally that we put the countries on the panel as we have put them. One of the questions is, uh, do we consider that Romania and Bulgaria will also have uh, uh, impact? Of course, Romania and Bulgaria are part of Southeast Europe and uh, some of them very important uh, energy-wise countries. But the panel was chosen uh, in order to focus more on the uh, area which is, uh, let's say, with a common infrastructure, which is that area of, uh, of the former Yugoslavia and the area where uh, 
uh, energy community is covering uh, uh, Greece and Slovenia were also, of course, very important for us. So my question to Professor Vushinovic is a good opening of the regional perspective. You said that you, as a small market, will probably have a big problem in uh, balancing variable renewables, uh, providing you build up hydropower plants, but we know what the fate of hydropower plants, plants so far was. At least I've been following them in Montenegro for the last 20 years. So uh, in the case that you don't succeed to build them, how you think you could balance wind and solar? Be because you can cover, is it uh, only the cable or uh, you think that the complementarity of the region could be, could be also uh, something that you could uh, gain from regarding this specific, specific issue? Thank you for the question. Beside the cable, we are very forward to V2G uh, concept, vehicle to grid, also to combine heat and power and uh, power to heat options and so on. So uh, it's going to be challenging and we have to rely on the collaboration with our neighbors. Uh, in the time of Yugoslavia, for instance, we have an agreement, our electro power system has an agreement with the Serbia uh, to exchange the energy from one uh, hydropower plant of Piva, uh, where we deliver the energy to the system of Serbia. And uh, because of that, we took uh, energy from the, uh, that energy from the uh, surroundings. Also, in the, in the past, we have aluminum industry here in Montenegro, which was very developed, very similar to the Mostar uh, aluminum uh, plant industry. Now it's on the recovering, and, uh, but it's not going to produce as much as before uh, raw aluminum, and it's going to produce the aluminum alloys. But in the time, in the time uh, of Yugoslavia, that was a really good balance because we we were able to, to collect the, all the energy all around the, uh, Yugoslavia to spend it uh, in the hour in the where no one else wants it. So uh, that may be another opportunity to, to make a balance. And also, of course, uh, we will have to look forward to see the solutions for the reversible uh, hydropower plants, because uh, I know that uh, uh, the on the river Moracha near the Podgorica, uh, there is a project uh, with the cascade and hydropower plants, and we are very looking forward to that project. It's uh, still on the paper, but it's going to be uh, considered very soon. And uh, we believe that uh, we can give the, some contribution regionally with uh, such a, a reversible hydropower plants and cable and maybe aluminum and also another another uh, issues. So it's going to be a challenging. So I believe that transition will go smoothly. But uh, I can say that uh, last year, uh, somewhere in, in the spring, when the thermal power plants was uh, out of operation, Montenegro has, uh, for a couple of days, totally covered our energy consumption by renewables, which means hydro, wind, and uh, some small solar. So it's, we, we, sh we, we show the example that it's possible even for the couple of days. So the thing thank you. Is thank you, Igor. Thank you. You, you. you exactly pointed to what is, I think, developing paradigm in the region. It's this uh, uh, water, wind, solar nexus that we all think could be the, uh, the key for 100% uh, decarbonization. But I would like to ask Professor Kakaras, because he mentioned in one of his remarks that we had in the correspondence the importance of hydrogen and uh, in general, what's your opinion uh, about the importance of gas and hydrogen, blue gas, green gas in Greece? And uh, do you foresee that as an important uh, resource, transitional uh, energy source in the, in the region? This is also the question for uh, Neven and for uh, Milka. I mean, we are approaching the end of the panel, so feel free to answer any question on the regional uh, perspective that I'm uh, addressing now to Professor Kakaras. So, Emmanuel, please, will you take it? Microphone. You have to switch the mic on. Sorry, I've got it. Okay. So thanks for the question. It's really interesting. 
uh, because what we are witnessing the, the last couple of years here in, in the wholesale market in Greece is a rather uh, um, uh, un, a steep increase on the wholesale price, which in fact is due to, uh, the reason is due to the fact that uh, gas fire generation is taking more and more uh, a bigger share on the electricity mix. And uh, that is inevitable because whenever you do uh, a phase out of coal and uh, also for economic reasons, old coal plants with high CO2 prices are not competitive. So they are squeezed out from the market. If you, if you must boil them a bit earlier, uh, you will come back with uh, more, um, uh, more gas fire generation. Of course, gas is a transient fuel, and I have to point out because there was a discussion on the capacity market. Somebody mentioned about capacity markets, and I have to point out that, for instance, in our case, the capacity markets have been reduced to the load following gas plants, with, which can back up uh, renewables, and not uh, in comparison to other countries, other European countries, where you have capacity payments even to the coal fleet. Uh, so gas is an intermittent fuel fuel. For the time being, that means uh, gas, uh, we are witnessing an increase on the S&P, on the marginal price due to the gas. That means the, the Greek market uh, is becoming more attractive for export, which is also a nice thing. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, what I would like to point out is that the so-called hydrogen readiness. Uh, you know, I'm... I'm uh, uh, member of board of the EU turbines and we came across last year with the hydrogen readiness of the of the gas um, gas turbine so it seems that by 2030 in a nutshell we will have equipment able to fire 100% hydrogen so uh, by, by now you can always run uh, fire 30% hydrogen so we there will be this hydrogen readiness as the, the ultimate goal, if society wants to go fully decarbonized, then you need hydrogen to achieve the so-called deep decarbonization. If the society decides that they can pull the brake at 60% renewables percentage in Europe, then you don't need hydrogen. But the, the signals we are getting uh, globally, and uh, not only in the European market, is that the society wants to be decarbonized. And if the society wants to be decarbonized, then uh, hydrogen is the only enabler who, which permits the long-term energy storage. So we have uh, to use gas as a transition fuel uh, in order to allow the, the, the introduction of hydrogen sooner or later. And of course, uh, there, will be, there is a price to be paid. Of course, thermodynamics for green hydrogen are uh, uh, inevitable, so you will have a high cost on electricity, but uh, this uh, could be outbalanced, I would say, with a massive electrification of the system. So in regional markets, we will have a relatively cheap electricity in oversupply. So I think that uh, uh, decarbonization and even deep decarbonization is a realistic target because it's linked with employment increase and it may very well happen earlier than 2050 if we uh, embark into a real ambitious goal. So thank you, thank you for presenting. If, if I may yeah, uh, Evan, please, address please, this please. hydrogen issue, uh, uh, I will relay a recent discussion in uh, ESAC steering, energy steering panel uh, of which I'm a member. And it seems there are two narratives for hydrogen. Uh, one is coming out of uh, keeping the infrastructures, uh, so using the existing infrastructures, and, uh, but that one ends with uh, maybe five times more primary energy, uh, which will not have, uh, we will not have them in Europe, so we will have to be importing a huge amount of uh, uh, hydrogen or synthetic fuels from other places. Another uh, uh, narrative is organic narrative uh, that uh, shows that hydrogen will only appear when the duck curve appears. So when renewables push the price to zero. 
Uh, and then uh, uh, this excess electricity will convert to new products. Uh, first, of course, they will uh, uh, move to heat uh, because that's the cheapest uh, and uh, most viable uh, market where excess electricity will move to. Uh, then to e-mobility, which by that time will be very much developed around Europe. And by 2035, 2040, there will be huge amounts of excess high, uh, uh, electricity which will finally uh, move into hydrogen. And in that case, if we go for uh, this organic hydrogen, uh, then we can forget about most of infrastructure, but we will need hydrogen to cover or synthetic fuels to cover around 10% of the final energy demand. Uh, and that is the most efficient uh, strategy. The truth will probably be somewhere in between uh, because of course, uh, uh, Europe is not uh, tabula rasa, there is a lot of interest which will push this side or, or that side. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. We once discussed this issue of the 100% renewable uh, decarbonization in the region. And uh, between you and me, we agreed that wind, water and solar is a key, but there is a missing link. There is, a, there is this uh, part uh, which is connected to, to, to some sort of the thermal, some sort of the thermal production. So the hydrogen is coming up now as a new uh, promising uh, technology. But in the region, there were also ideas about using biomass as a source of uh, combined heat and uh, power production. It's not so uh, popular these days because of the uh, actual practice of management of the forests in the region, where people are really afraid that that would be the slaughter of the of the forests in, in the region. But uh, I would like to use this remaining uh, part of a couple of minutes for anyone who would like to comment more on the regional perspective of energy transition. And then I will just spare the last two minutes for me for the concluding remarks. So any of the panelists who would like to comment on uh, on the issue. Uh, Andre, you have one minute. Uh, thank you. So I'm looking at, uh, we, we've done a lot of discussion about large scale generation of electricity, as this is very important, but also about the flexible consumption and about the consumers that are now going into self supply that can use cheap production that can do individually and also cheap storage because the batteries and the energy storage, maybe also heat storage is gaining ground. And this is what we are observing in Europe. So also in the region, we need to think about this, not just saying, okay, this is something that's happening to rich countries and it will not happen here. It will because the gradient of the fall of the price is so, so fast. And second, this helps the communities build together so to work together the, the neighbors work together and install the pvs on the on their uh, common roofs or on the fire brigade uh, buildings public buildings schools and in croatia the green energy society this is uh, showing us the way how cooperatives can do this and this is something please take a look at this and uh, think about this because this is a trend in clean energy package and it's the, the way forward. Thank you, Andrew, for mentioning that. That's very, very close to my heart, what, what you said, that, uh, that fills the, the remaining part of the energy transition, which is democratization. But uh, do we have anyone who wants to say something on the regional? Of course, of course, Energy Secretariat. Yeah. Represent the Milka, yeah. the floor is yours. I just want to to uh, support what Andre said. Really, it, one aspect is big thing, big thinking, and so on. Big plants waiting for hydrogen, waiting for something great and new to appear. But in the meantime, there is life. And really, I have already mentioned, but it is never too much to repeat. All those should be left open. And the policymakers, if they want to help, they should facilitate all these initiatives. The storage small, prosumers, they have now a new name, but whatever, prosumers to, to collect then uh, 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 any kind of self-consumption. It all should be 
somehow supported or even not financially, but open the door and in, uh, enabling legislation and cooperation between the, the, the contracting parties. It is also key, the balancing too. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Let's so, Professor Vushinovic, yeah, you have the... Uh, because we talk about renewables and uh, the main issue is the stability of the system. So I believe that the, 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 the greatest contribution to the stability is the connection between our systems and the exchange of energy between us. Uh, I, I got a question from the one of the attendants. Uh, what Romania and Bulgaria can uh, do the, for, the, uh, uh, for the additional to, to help the, the Southeast Europe? So then I remember that in uh, maybe 25 years ago, we have a nuclear power plants in Bulgaria who gave a stability to the Balkan countries. And then after they shut out the Kozlodui, we, uh, we feel the consequences of that for some period of time. So I believe that uh, we have to be connected much more and uh, we may have to focus on the main, uh, primary on our thermal power plants because I read somewhere that uh, uh, Balkanian thermal power plants pollute more, uh, in, uh, pollute more uh, air than the all thermal power plants in EU, which is terrible, which is terrible information. So we have to focus on that. But losing the thermal power plants, we will say that we will lose the stability. So the question is how to provide the stability. One of the key questions is maybe cable with Italy, maybe with the connection with the bigger countries to, to have a, uh, to make a, a very wide and spread and, and a good distribution system between us. And also with the EU. Maybe I'm wrong. I want to see something, something else, uh, to hear something else if I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rushen. So we are, we are getting closer to 8 o'clock, to the end of the panel. Uh, I think we have also answered the questions from the audience. Uh, let me just repeat what I said early in the, the morning, that I think the region is as a crossroad. We have uh, some very decisive two to three years and I think uh, the planning uh, process that is uh, ongoing, uh, especially national energy and climate plans is, uh, is a possibility to start really discussing uh, on the wider uh, stakeholder participation of the importance and possibility of energy transition. My personal opinion and that's confirmed also in the energy transition index for the economic forum is that uh, the region, the countries, the administration, the policymakers are not yet ready for this uh, dramatic transformation. What will be the speed of that change? I don't know. But I know that the expert community and the professional community in the region should work to provide answers which will enable also the paradigm change. And I will close this panel with emphasizing once again, it's not my, it's something uh, that I have heard, it's not my saying that energy transition in Europe will not be efficient or will not be finished at all if it's not done in Southeast Europe. Not because it's so important part of the Europe, but because Southeast Europe has something to offer in the whole puzzle of energy transition in the European Union. It has the complementarities to the Central and Eastern Europe. So that all means that in order to play that role, in order to provide some of the flexibility services to Greece, some of the flexibility services to Italy, to Central Europe, countries in the Balkans, countries in the Western Balkans, countries in the region of Southeast Europe have two successfully realize its own energy transition. Otherwise, we will be in a position to provide some of the services and still have the local production, which is based on polluting uh, uh, fuels like, like coal. I know it's not gonna be easy, and I would be very happy if in the next couple of years, we will be energy transition ready countries, which means there will be infrastructure which will enable market forces to play their role. So I thank all the panelists. 
I see the participants uh, slowly also leaving. So thank you once again. Thank you, Nemir, for inviting me to be the moderator of this uh, interesting panel. We have discussed these issues and I'm looking forward to continue a discussion with all of you. Some of you I have already known, some of you I was looking forward to meet in Sarajevo and hopefully we'll meet somewhere else or next time in Sarajevo. So thank you, thank you all for participating and I think we have a, an interesting discussion and probably the organizer will also be able to extract some of the key points that we have emphasized today. So thank for the participants and bye.